Hello, Advanced Biology, uh, AP Biology students. Um, this is going to be our conclusion to the chapter on energetics. So um, we end it with looking at the enzyme substrate complex. <clears throat> and we said that the enzyme itself, um, most often protein-based, <clears throat> will bind to the substrate. And the substrate itself is the uh, reactant to a chemical equation and that reactant is going to bind to the enzyme at an area called the active site um, and what happens is uh, we look at two types of models when dealing with enzymes uh, we look at the uh, enzyme as a lock key model which basically is telling us that the enzyme is specific to the reaction that it catalyzes or a step of the reaction um, or more basically, uh, we could say that the, the uh, reactant is um, specific to the enzyme itself. And then we look at that when that reactant is going to bind, or that substrate is going to bind to the enzyme at the active site, we get this induced fit model where the enzyme will change its shape to uh, basically kind of hold that reactant in place as the reactant is going to be converted to the product so <clears throat> and please know that when I say reactant again that that is referring to the substrate of that enzyme so that conversion there um, will take place and then what will be released will be the end product of that reaction or of that uh, metabolic pathway it could also be an intermediate product Two basic types of reactions that can occur. We have those reactions that are degradation reactions and other ones that are synthesis reactions. And basically in a degradation reaction, uh, the enzyme complex, com enzyme complexes with a single substrate molecule. And that substrate is gonna be broken apart in two product molecules that are then released. Um, this would be most representative of a <clears throat> hydrolysis reaction. Um, the other one would be synthesis, and of course you know that uh, our best example of this would be dehydration synthesis. Um, enzyme complexes with two substrate molecules that will come together, and the substrates will be released as a single product. Um, we could also um, look at these as uh, synthesizing something, that would be photosynthesis, and degrading something, breaking it down, that could be cellular, cellular respiration. So there are many examples of, in biology um, where you have these degradation and synthesis reactions that are taking place. And here's what you can see. Um, both of those react reactions, examples of what will be occurring there. So you see in the upper block, we have the two products coming in and being released as, uh, I, I lie, we have the uh, one reactant coming in to the active site of the enzyme and being released as two products. So if this were <coughs> lactose coming in here, um, the two products released would be a glucose molecule and a galactose molecule. Down here we have a synthesis reaction and basically we are bringing two things in there. Um, we could say that this could be glucose and fructose um, if glucose and fructose are coming in, binding the active site and they're going to be released as sucrose. Energy of activation. Um, basically we know the molecules frequently do not react with one another unless they are activated in some way. Um, energy must be added to at least one reactant to initiate the reaction. Um, this would be the energy of activation. We abbreviate energy of activation as E of A and basically what the energy of activation is um, it's the amount of energy that is available. So the energy that must be added to cause molecules to react with one another. So it's energy um, that is needed to get that reaction going. Um, then you have free energy, which is the amount of energy that is available to help get that reaction going. So basically the ease of A energy is going to prevent molecules from spontaneously degrading in the cell. So the Energy of activation is what we consider this barrier. And what we need to do is we need to lower that barrier 
to help that reaction proceed quickly or at, at a quicker rate. Um, so here's how basically enzymes operate. Um, they're going to come in and they're going to help to lower that energy of activation. Um, they're going to lower the energy of activation by bringing substrates into contact with one another. And ultimately, this influences the rate of which, um, and the, the, this influences the rate of the reaction. And it also is a way um, that enzymes um, help speed up that reaction. So when we think of it, um, remember our reaction diagrams, if we look at it here, we have uh, free energy on one side. Again, that is, uh, you, you heard of Gibbs free energy, the amount of energy required um, available for a reaction to get going. Um, then you have the activation energy, which is the amount of energy required to start that reaction. So if we look at the blue line, we could see that the E sub A barrier is quite high, but when we introduce an enzyme into the chemical reaction, um, you do lower that E sub A barrier. So with an enzyme present, you have uh, a lower hill here, and that enzyme, when you're going from reactant to product, will help speed up that reaction and help it occur more spontaneously than if that uh, pathway did not have an enzyme. There are a couple factors that do affect enzymatic speed. Basically, substrate concentration. Um, you also have enzyme concentration as well um, that would uh, affect the uh, enzymatic speed or the speed of an enzyme. But basically, what we see is as you increase the substrate or the reactant within a chemical equation, um, enzyme activity generally increases uh, as, as you increase the substrate. And this happens is because you're going to have more frequent collisions between um, substrate molecules and that enzyme. What we see with temperature, uh, typically what will happen in temperature, enzyme activity uh, would increase with temperature. And we know that warmer temperatures cause more effective collisions between the enzyme and substrate. In chemistry, this is where we'd think of that kinetic molecular theory. Um, basically, uh, we learned at the beginning of this chapter what kinetic energy is. It is a uh, the energy of motion. And truly what temperature is uh, measuring is the kinetic energy of a substance. So as you increase the temperature, you're increasing the kinetic energy of those particles. So they're moving faster. And if those particles are moving faster, as stated in the kinetic molecular, kinetic molecular theory, um, you're going to have collision of molecules take place a lot more than if the temperature were lower. Um, think about how you would move in warmer weather as an athlete or just being outside versus if you're in colder weather. You tend to be a little bit uh, slower in colder weather and uh, move quicker in warmer weather. However, there does become a point at which temperature uh, denatures or destroys the enzyme. Remember that protein denaturization is when you unravel or unfold that protein. So if the temperature does get too, too hot, um, the enzyme can be destroyed and then the en uh, enzyme itself will be ineffective um, because it will no longer be there to help catalyze the reaction. Um, Siamese cats have a mutation that causes enzymes to be active um, at cooler temperatures and that affects uh, coloration in Siamese cats. And I think there might be um, a picture of a Siamese cat in your, in your textbook. The other thing that affects enzymes is pH. Remember that pH is uh, a, a measurement of the hydrogen ion concentration in solution. And the higher the hydrogen ion concentration in solution, the lower the pH or more acidic you are. Um, basically, most enzymes are optimized for a particular pH. And basically, when you talk about uh, the optimal, optimal range, um, the optimal range or pH is the range at which that enzyme will work at its best. Um, if you start to come out of that optimal range, uh, then you either um, slow down the enzyme. So in the case of pepsin and trypsin, um, 
optimum protein digestion takes place at their respective uh, pH optima. So if we look um, here, we can see temperature, the effect of temperature on rate of reaction. Um, here we have the rate of the reaction product per unit of time and temperature in degrees Celsius. So you can see right around 40 degrees Celsius is when <clears throat> is the rate at which that enzyme would work best. And we have two types of animals. Body temperatures of ectothermic animals often limit rates of reaction. Remember that ectothermic reactions, they are heated from the outside. We see this a lot with reptiles. And here we see this lizard or iguana. So their body temperature is regulated by the ambient uh, air temperatures or outside air temperatures. And then we have those animals that are endothermic and the body uh, temperatures of endothermic animals promotes rates of reaction. Here we can see our examples of uh, pH ranges. Um, here are two di digestive enzymes, pepsin and trypsin. We see that pepsin um, is an enzyme of the stomach and it does function best at a pH of two because our gastric juices have an acidity of around uh, two. And over here, we have trypsin. Um, trypsin is an enzyme often um, helping with mechanical digestion, and that has a pH of around eight. Factors affecting enzymatic speed. Uh, what we see is also that cells can regulate the presence or absence of an enzyme. Um, the cells can regulate the concentration of an enzyme and cells can activate or deactivate some enzymes. And this is where we see things like inhibitors and cofactors come into play. So what is an enzyme cofactor? Well, molecules are, are required to activate enzymes. And basically what we see here is you have all heard of, of FAD and NAD plus and NADP plus. Um, these guys are all cofactors, and they are the first, uh, the first two, FAD and NAD+, excuse me, are what you see in cellular respiration, and NADP+, is what you see in um, photosynthesis. So, uh, cofactors themselves, uh, basically, these are uh, inorganic ions or non-protein organic molecules that are found at an active site. And basically what's going to happen is um, when they are at the active site, they are going to help that enzyme uh, be active. Um, these ions and molecules like FAD, NAD plus and NAD plus um, are going to be there at that active site for when that substrate would come in. Um, the other thing is a coenzyme. Um, coenzymes are non-protein organic molecules. Uh, the non-protein organic molecules, uh, basically, um, these coenzymes are, are are um things like small vitamins. Uh, and vitamins are those organic compounds. Um, required in the diet for the synthesis of coenzymes. Um, they can be uh, other coenzymes themselves. Uh, vitamins are part of uh, a coenzyme's uh, molecular structure. Um, it is very important um, if a vitamin is not available uh, for uh, the making of coenzymes, uh, enzymatic activity can decrease and will uh, result with a, a vitamin deficiency disorder. Um, you might have heard of hmm, niacin. If you heard of a niacin deficiency, um, that is going to result in a skin disease called pellagra, and riboflavin uh, is a deficiency resulting in um, cracks of the corners of the mouth. <sighs> that is the Siamese cat. Um, here you can see uh, the cofactors at the active site. So there's our cofactor on the active site of that, that enzyme there. And basically when that substrate binds, uh, we do see that eventually that product will be released.
All right, enzyme inhibition, um, reversible, I had to go blow my nose, um, a reversible uh, enzyme inhibition, uh, reversible enzyme inhibition. Basically what we see here is a substance known as an inhibitor binds to the enzyme and will decrease its activity. And we have two types of inhibition. We have competitive inhibition and we have <clears throat> non-competitive inhibition. Um, competitive inhibition is uh, basically when you have a substrate and whatever the inhibitor is are both going to bind to the active site and they compete with one another. Um, the product forms only when the substrate will bind to that active site and, and not the, the uh, inhibitor itself. In non-competitive inhibition, basically you're going to have an inhibitor bind to an area of the enzyme that is at a location other than the active site. Um, <clears throat> Uh, basically, what we call this uh, is the allosteric site, and allo means other, so it's gonna it's gonna bind the enzyme somewhere else. And ultimately, what happens then in the non-competitive inhibition is it's going to change the shape initiated by the inhibitor binding to the allosteric site. Uh, will change the shape of the active site, and it will uh, render that enzyme uh, unable to bind to the substrate. So uh, remember when we said lock key induced fit uh, for substrate and enzyme complexes. So if you change the shape of that active site, um, that substrate, which is very specific to the active site, uh, will not bind there. And we could see uh, here is non-competitive inhibition. So uh, E sub 1 is the uh, enzyme. Over here we have the... Uh, allosteric site and over here we have uh, <clears throat> the reactant so what would happen is normally um, the reactant will come in so the reactant will be a binding to the enzyme at the active site and that end product then would be released and you'd have B and then it would go all the way through keep going keep going keep going and eventually our end product would be F um, so what would happen then is uh, here what we have, uh, this end product F, all right, F binds to an allosteric site and the active site of E sub 1 will change its shape. Therefore, it will not allow A or that reactant or substrate to come in and bind to that active site. Okay, so you can see that there. Um, overall, when you talk about inhibition, the enzyme is not hurt or, or changed or destroyed or damaged in any way. Um, this entire process is irreversible. Um, often, uh, we do see this in a, in a way, um, if we are starting to build too much of a product, uh, the body will come back and inhibit the production um, of that particular product until it is needed again. So that way we don't produce an overabundance of it. Um, uh, yeah, I guess that's all about uh, what I want to say with that there. Um, last things, enzyme inhibitors can spell death. Um, materials that irreversibly inhibit an enzyme are known as poisons. Um, basically, uh, there are two poisons that, uh, three poisons that are mentioned um, in the textbook that we would be getting. Um, that would be cyanide. Um, that's going to inhibit enzymes required for ATP production. Sarin is uh, going to inhibit an enzyme located at the neuromuscular junction. Um, Normuscular junction would be where you have a nerve ending attaching to a skeletal muscle cell in order to allow for that nerve impulse to come in for a contraction of the muscle. And warfarin is going to inhibit an enzyme responsible for blood clotting process. Um, basically bringing in those 
fibroblasts, which are going to lay down the material and begin the development of new skin for a wound. We also have oxidation reduction reactions. Um, and very quickly, because we have done this before, um, in general, oxidation reduction reactions or redox reactions are electrons being passed from one molecule to another. Oxidation is the loss of an electron. Reduction is the gain of electron. Um, when you have one occur, the other one is taking place at the same time. So one molecule or an atom is going to an accept that electron, which is given up by the other. Um, in the production of sodium chloride, sodium is oxidized and chlorine is reduced. Um, this is a new acronym that I've learned, but you could use oil rig. Um, oil rig is oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. When we look at our two equations that we are going to study in detail in the next two chapters, uh, photosynthesis and cellular respiration, we will look like at a metabolic pathway that is driven by enzymes and a series of oxidation reduction reactions. Um, where one molecule will be oxidized and losing electrons and other molecules will be reduced in gaining those electrons. Uh, so this is our next focus. Um, the chloroplast and photosynthesis. Uh, chloroplasts are going to capture that solar energy and use it to convert water and CO2 to a carbohydrate. And hydrogen atoms are transferred from water to carbon dioxide as glucose forms. Carbon dioxide can be reduced and water will be oxidized initially in photosynthesis, donating those electrons. Um, this energy is provided by solar energy and the reduction of CO2 to form a molecule of glucose stores uh, 686 kilocalories in the chemical bonds of glucose. Living organisms can then oxidize that glucose and basically make ATP. So when uh, that... Uh, ATP molecule we know is that energy is stored within the bonds. Um, cellular respiration consumes oxygen and produces carbon dioxide and the equation is the opposite of photosynthesis equation. Um, glucose being oxidized, lost hydrogen atoms and oxygen has been reduced to gain hydrogen atoms and therefore our end product is water. Um, cells oxidize glucose step by step and the energy is stored and converted to ATP molecules. And basically what we see is photosynthesis cellular respiration form a cycle where the carbohydrate produced in chloroplast becomes the fuel for cellular respiration in mitochondria. Um, carbon dioxide released by mitochondria becomes a substrate during photosynthesis as chloroplast. And basically what we see is both organelles are involved in a redox cycle where CO2 is being reduced in photosynthesis and a carbohydrate is oxidized in cellular respiration. The energy does not cycle between the two organelles. It flows from one, from the sun. It flows from the sun through a uh, series of steps of photosynthesis and cellular respiration, which we will call metabolic pathways. And eventually, because we know of the laws of thermodynamics, um, eventually it becomes unusable heat when ATP is used by the cell because during any every ener uh, energy transformation you only get so much energy out of there and the rest of it is lost in the form of heat. Um, this also uh, really does give you an overview of the relationship between autotrophic organisms and heterotrophic organisms. So that is all for today. Thank you and have a wonderful day.